I'm going to introduce Ron and then I'll hand it over to you. So uh, Ron is from the United Indian Nation and his work really revolves around um, educating interested parties in the longstanding contributions of indigenous people. So he's done work as a lead interpreter and reenactor at uh, through the nation's living history program. So he's done work at Fort Samix National Monument, Oriskany Battlefield, Valley Forge, Saratoga, um, and has told the historic story of the Oneida Nation during the Revolutionary War, which is what we're going to talk about tonight. Um, so Ron, I'm going to turn it over to you and we can get started. Okay. Thank you very much, everybody, for uh, attending this evening. Uh, as Miranda was saying, uh, if you have any questions or any uh, anything that pops up or concerns, uh, please uh, feel free to ask or uh, send the uh, a chat so that uh, we can get everything uh, answered for you. I don't want anyone to leave this evening with any kind of questions. Uh, if you have a crazy, you think it's a crazy question, uh, by all means, don't don't feel afraid to ask because uh, in this business, I've heard many, many different questions that range from all fourth graders all the way up to the elderly. And uh, every one of them were interesting and I could answer every one of them. So tonight we're gonna talk about the United Indian Nation and the connection to the Revolutionary War and this geographical area. Uh, one of the things we got to begin to first understand when we start looking at the Oneida, uh, and you're, if you're familiar with this geographical area, um, the first thing that people see is the Turning Stone Casino and the recognition of the prosperity of the nation over the last uh, 25 years. Uh, it hasn't always been like that. Uh, the nation has um, thrived in this central area of New York for well over a thousand years. Uh, when we go to look at the United Nation, if we're not a standalone nation. We are actually part of what we call the Haudenosaunee. The Haudenosaunee are uh, a family of nations um, all clustered together. Uh, you may be familiar with the nations. Uh, I, I will recite them for you. Uh, going from uh, Western New York all the way to uh, Eastern New York to the Hudson River is uh, in the very West is the Seneca Nation. Uh, the Seneca Nation when we say the Seneca Nation, we don't refer to them as, uh, we're not actually saying the Seneca people because um, what we're saying is people of the rolling hills. And if you've ever been in their territory, their ancestral territory over by the Genesee River, Canandaigua, um, Rochester area south of there, Letchworth State Park, a lot of rolling hills all the way into the Alleghenies into the Ohio Valley. That translated Seneca means rolling hills. If you move a little further east, you get to the Cayuga territory, which is recognized around the Finger Lakes. Uh, Cayuga means people of the swamp. Uh, because of the marshy areas and the Finger Lakes within that geographical area. You move a little further to the east, you get in central New York, uh, and you find the Onondaga Nation. Onondaga refers to the Great Hill. Uh, and if you've ever been south of Syracuse on 81, you drive through their territory of the Great Hill. Uh, going a little further east of Onondaga Nation, you come into the Oneida Territory, um, which means people of the Standing Stone. And that refers to, uh, in more contemporary time, it refers to 
the giant granite stone that would be placed at the um, central longhouse of the villages. Uh, but when you look at the origins, it goes back to the creation story, saying that um, this is the geographical area in which um, the creator stood upon a giant granite stone and gave the um, directions to all the four races of the world. You go a little further to the east of us, you get into the Mohawk Valley, which is the Mohawk territory. Mohawk means people of the Flint. And the reason for that is because to the north of them is the Adirondack mountain range. To the south of them is the Catskill mountain range. And in the soil, there's a lot of Flint. So they're known as people of the Flint. Uh, that's what we call the Haudenosaunee. Uh, they've been united for the last uh, thousand years, over millennia. They've been uh, unified together. They say that they uprooted the great tree of peace in the um, geographical area of the Onondaga Nation. And they buried all their weapons of war underneath this white pine that they uprooted and replanted it upon those weapons of war, symbolizing they were bearing the hatchet against one another and they unified. Now, when you look deeper into those nations, they are actually made up of nine families. We call them clans. Uh, there are three water, three land, and three air. Uh, and they refer to each one of the families are designated in, uh, in some sort of fashion in one of the nations. So the United Nation here, we have actually three of the clans. We have the turtle, the wolf, and the bear. Uh, in the Mohawk Nation, they have the turtle, wolf, and the bear. In the Onondaga Nation, where the central fire is kept, uh, they have all nine of the clans. When you get over to the Cayugas, they have six, and then Senecas have all uh, all the clans except for Eel, they have eight clans in them. And so those nine families make up all of those uh, people of the Haudenosaunee. Haudenosaunee means people of the longhouse. And if you were to spread that longhouse across the geographical territory of New York State between Western New York and the um, Eastern borders of the Hudson, that is recognized as the Haudenosaunee territory. Uh, now, when we go to look at it, so we're all family. We look at it as ourselves as related to one another. And this is very important to remember when we get into recognizing the Oneidas uh, making their decision to fight alongside of the Patriots uh, in further on down the line. And I'll, we'll talk more about that. I just wanted to get some of the um, precursor to some of the war events uh, down in an understanding of who the people are. Uh, before I go any further, I just want to kind of explain a little bit about myself. Uh, I come to you today with the information that I've uh, researched over the years through, um, whether it be through uh, I used to work at the fort doing a lot of work there, reenacting, and I had, uh, I was privy to some of the archives of some of the soldiers and the recollection of their encounters with the Oneidas. Uh, my grandfather lived to be 84 years old and uh, in our family homestead where I grew up at the Seneca Nation, we had, I had seven sisters, my grandfather and my mother and my father all living in one household. So my grandfather would teach me every day about these types of things. I would take it for granted. You know, it's, oh, everybody knows that. Everybody knows the clans. Everybody knows um, how the clans came to be and how the nations came to be and the origins of the creation story um, for our people. 
I took that for granted because I grew up right there with my grandfather who translated a lot of that to me. He spoke Seneca uh, and he could explain things to me. And my father was the uh, nation uh, planner and a tribal judge for 26 years. So he made sure that I was fully aware of contract and treaties with the federal government, state government, and the indigenous people. So learning all of that with, through my family and then researching quite a bit of it, uh, a lot of my work was done through uh, Henry Morgan and a uh, uh, few other authors of uh, uh, indigenous um, background, uh, Iroquois background. Uh, so that's where my education comes from. Uh, in school, when I was in college, uh, I took a liking to different origins of uh, learning about religion, different religions around the world. And I use it as a comparison to our religion because our religion and our social beliefs and our um, governmental beliefs all are all intertwined into one. Uh, and when it comes down to it, back when James Madison and Benjamin Franklin would attend our Grand Council meetings at the Onondaga Nation, one of the things that they noticed was how complicated our system of government was. And it was quoted that Benjamin Franklin said that, how can these five savage nations be so intricate and um, disciplined with their governmental beliefs? And it stems from our understanding of what we know as the great law or our constitution. So that's a little bit of background about myself and where my education comes from when I go to uh, do a lot of these lectures and um, explanations of the history of the Oneida people. So getting back to uh, when we look at the uh, very origins of why the Oneidas sided with the Patriots, it goes back to, now you have to step back a few years back to uh, 1756. 1756, the Seven Year War or the French and Indian War here is known as uh, was taking place. At that time, the British government came to our Grand Council and asked our war chiefs if we would back them in the campaign to defend them against the French. So the Haudenosaunee people came together in a grand council and they all agreed. They said, okay, we'll come together. We'll help the British um, because they're our friends. Uh, at this time, we were doing a lot of trading with them, a lot of uh, the, the colonists were beginning to push forward, westward more into Indian territory. Um, so we were becoming more acquainted with um, our new guests. So after the war was over, uh, we maintained a friendship with the British and the Patriots. Uh, and around 1763 or so, they established the Crown's proclamation of a frontier line, which basically ran through, started in Rome, New York, came across central New York into Pennsylvania, down into the Ohio Valley. And everything east of this um, proclamation was recognized as um, colonist area, colonist territory. Everything to the west of it was recognized as uh, more of uh, Indian country. Uh, there was not a whole lot of organization by the colonists in those territories, although they did take up placement at Fort Niagara and um, 
Port Oswego and, and areas like that, um, deep in the Indian country. Uh, one of the reasons why this particular area was so important to the British and the Patriots uh, when the, in the early years of the war was that the British knew they could use the waterways coming from the St. Lawrence Seaway into uh, Lake Ontario southward into New York and then flowing into Pennsylvania then eventually into Delaware and to the lower states without too much um, campaign from the Patriots along the coastal areas. So they knew it was primal for them to get those grounds associated with the waterways. Uh, in the early years of the war, again, the British government and the Patriot and the uh, Patriots came to our Grand Council and they asked for our support. And in doing so, the war chief sat down and uh, this time they said, well, what we don't want to do is get in the middle of a fight between a father and a son, meaning the crown being the father and the son being the, the colonist. So they said, what we're going to do is we're going to stay neutral at this time. And as they decided to stay neutral, uh, within the Oneida nation, our central uh, village that we had here, uh, we call it today is known as Oneida Castle. Uh, there was a leader there by the name of Chief Scanandoa. Now Scanandoa befriended Samuel Kirkland. Uh, and understanding this is a good part of it, um, was building their friendship between Samuel Kirkland and Chief Scanandoa. When Scanandoa uh, invited Samuel Kirkland to come in. He brought, he was actually uh, a missionary priest when he came in. So his job was to come in and convert the indigenous people into Christianity. So in doing so, they translated the um, Bible into the Oneida language and um, they were able to read it directly from their Bible. So they were good friends with Samuel Kirkland. Now at the same time, years before that, Sir William Johnson was trying to get the favor of uh, Chief Scanandoa too, but it came back to uh, the deciding factors was based on, uh, was actually based on a religious belief because the religious belief of um, the uh, Sir William Johnson was an angelitic and the belief of Samuel Kirkland was Presbyterian. So they sided with his faith, uh, Samuel Kirkland's faith and Samuel Kirkland was friends with the Patriots. So when the war began and uh, we can actually look back to dates uh, when we, when we look into, uh, Miranda, if you want to click into the... Um, yeah, I can share. Okay. Do you want to share that? And a lot of what you have here uh, refers more to um, this is uh, your factual areas of the understanding so uh, if I if I'm explaining some stuff and you're not quite sure you can use this as your reference guide guide to come back and take a look at um, can they get copies of that too Miranda or is that um, yeah we can try to make that available or if they're, they on our to... Facebook page okay yeah we can do that okay so now, when we go to look back at the dates of uh, 
the campaigns that got them involved, we look at the uh, seizure of Forrest Stanwix. Now, up until this point, the seizure of Forrest Stanwix takes place uh, August 2nd of 1777 and lasted until August 20, 21st, uh, 1777. Uh, so during this time frame, the Oneidas would, were not involved in any of the skirmishes, but they were more or less just aiding them as to um, showing them the landscape, um, delivering them messages uh, from one point, one maybe from one fort to another, uh, taking columns of soldiers, uh, not fighting alongside of them, but just delivering goods and things like that. Because within this area, you got to remember this is this is the Oneida's backyard. Um, the fort was uh, built in 1756 under the permission of the Oneida Nation. They gave them the permission to build it there. So they knew exactly how important it was for the fort to be there. Uh, the fort was built there uh, for the protection of the, what they call the carry, where they would take their boats out of the Mohawk River and carry them over to Woods Creek and vice versa when they would be traveling along that wood uh, waterway. So now when you go to look at uh, when the Oneidas let them build the fort there, they agreed that they would build them a trading post there also. So when you go into the fort, people don't realize this, but some of the soldiers that do the interpretation there tell them that, oh yeah, it was where the soldiers went to go and buy their goods. But you got to remember that if you're familiar with the time period, the money that the soldiers got most times was just paper money that could have been made by an individual that didn't carry any weight that the sutler would not use. Uh, so when the Oneidas would come in with pelts, that's what they used for money or the, the skins of the of the deer. Uh, they would. That's why you refer to it as a buck. Uh, the, the hide would be worth a dollar. And, and so on. So the cellar was actually designed there for the Oneidas. So 1777, August 2nd, the siege begins. The Oneidas uh, are asked to stay out of the war at this point and they agreed to, uh, but the Grand Council left them with this, with this thought that they said, if you have to protect yourself, you protect your families and your people. Uh, we're not gonna condone any war that may start within your areas or back your nation or any other nations as the Confederacy known as the Iroquois Confederacy or the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. Uh, so, they were individually, they, would, they told the nations, if you wanted to uh, support somebody, that's totally up to you. But if war starts out, we're not going to send anybody to, um, to help you. So when they were under siege, they asked their Oneida neighbors to actually guide a group from uh, Fort Dayton which is now known as, today as um, Herkimer, New York, in that area, uh, under from the general that led the column out, his militia, uh, his name was uh, Herkimer, General Herkimer. When the Oneidas began to call them out and bring them towards uh, Oriskany, uh, today we know it as Oriskany, but the village that stood there was called Ariska. Uh, and there was an Oneida village that General Herkimer's men uh, stayed at on August 5th. They stayed the night there. And then August 6th, um, they began to their trek onward to final 
finalize probably the last six miles of their journey um, onto the fort to help aid the siege. Uh, the siege was uh, was was under siege by uh, General Saint Ledger, who came from the north down down through the waterways uh, across Oneida Lake, uh, Oneida Lake onto uh, the upper side of uh, the fort area, the northwest side of the fort, and began to trench and tunnel into uh, towards the fort. Now he had 2,000, a column of 2,000 men that were, uh, that laid siege to the fort. So they needed backup. And when Herkimer was on his way to the fort, uh, the Oneidas, uh, now there's been a various numbers of Oneidas. They say there was um, 60 of them. They say there was 100 of them. I've seen some accounts where there was um, 120 Oneidas in a column with them. So the number varies. Uh, but they know that there was Oneidas there present leading them into uh, the fort area. About six miles outside of the fort, they came to a ravine where the Oneidas or the the Oneidas led General Herkimer down into the ravine. And as they were getting um, water and getting re uh, replenishments of water, the Senecas and the Mohawks took uh, a vantage point on the upper ridge of uh, flanking both sides of the column as they were down into the ravine. Uh, now, when they started the battle, the battle started, and there's only one thing that they don't know for sure. They don't know for sure if it was a Seneca or a Mohawk that fired the first shot, but they know it was one of the um, indigenous uh, party that fired upon the Oneidas. So taking you back to the origins of the Haudenosaunee people, you have to remember that for a thousand years, for a couple hundred years, even while the colonists were building, uh, developing their colonists along the coastal areas, the Haudenosaunee people had been thriving in this area for well over 500 years under peace and uh, a joint partnership. And they can say that on August 6th of 1777, on the ring of that first fire, the the tribal fires of the Haudenosaunee were dampened at that point because they were never strengthened. They were never up to their full strength after that time period. They never stood as a one unified group after that. Because uh, prior to that, they would make decisions as a whole, as a confederacy. Like if you understand the United States of America are made up of 50 states. After that point in time, it's like breaking the states up into it, individual states and uh, not as one unified uh, recognized as uni unified United States. So August 6, 1777, the Oneidas or the Senecas and Mohawks attacked the Oneidas and began to start the battle. And there on your screen, if you can see that, there's a rendition of, uh, of a portrait of the Battle of Oriskany. And a, one of the main uh, People recognized in the Battle of Oriskany was uh, Chief Hanieri uh, and his wife, Two Cuddles. You can see his wife alongside of him. At that time, it wasn't common for women to fight alongside of men. But during this battle, because they were pinned down on the ravine, down in the ravine, uh, 
she fought alongside her husband. Uh, as he fired, he got injured in his hand. So she would reload his musket. Is um, He would fire a musket, then reload. She would reload. And they did this for quite a while. Now, one of the unique things about this battle that's told uh, is that in even today, if I go anywhere in Indian country, if I go down to the Seneca Nation, to Allegheny, Cattaraugus, Six Nations, um, Akwazasne, uh, Ganawage, uh, I know a lot of people there. So when you get these amount of people, they're going to know one another. So the Oneidas are going to know most of the Senecas and Mohawks that are there. The militia, the militia was made up of uh, colonists that lived in the Mohawk Valley. Now, most of the men that came and fought for the British were also um, located loyalists that lived in the Mohawk Valley. So they knew one another. Uh, they say it was one of the bloodiest battles of the Revolutionary War. This battle took place for lasted for five hours long. The first hour of the battle was considered musket fire from the ridge uh, where General Herkimer took a shot to the thigh and he they propped him up against a tree and he continued to uh, direct the battle from the, the tree side of the ravine. So as this was happening, the weather came in about an hour after the battle started and the rains began to come down. They said it rained for four hours after that and till about the end of the conclusion of the battle where if you're familiar with flintlock weapons, flintlock weapons, your powder needs to be dry it refers to that, you know, um, you know, keep your powder dry. Uh, referring to your, your black powder, because once it gets wet, it just basically turns into a, a soppy uh, clay mud mixture that isn't going to be useful for anything. So without your musket fire, but the battle continuing on, a lot of the battle was done hand-to-hand -hand combat, meaning with war clubs, with um, the butt end of their guns, uh, with knives, with bayonets. Uh, so during this battle, a lot of blood was shed because of that. And that's why they say it was one of the bloodiest battles of the revolution. Uh, they still do a lot of uh, archeological digs over there. Um, they still find remnants, uh, which is very interesting uh, to me be only because of my history history buff and I like to uh, look into that kind of stuff. Um, but and that, Ron, so yeah. is, this, is this the place where that peace tree that you were talking about is planted or is that somewhere else? No, this is, uh, if you're familiar with Rome, New York, this is six miles outside of Rome, New York to the east. Uh, there's a monument that actually stands there today marking the uh, Battle of Oriskany. Today, it's all cleared out into a big open field. Uh, but just like the rendition of this portrait here, it would have been a, a fully wooded area. Uh, so once the battle was over, it was at that point that the Oneidas uh, gathered and took a standing to uh, realizing that their brother and had just fought against them, uh, breaking that, uh, that chain of peace that had stood for thousands of years. Um, and they sided with the, at that point they decided, well, the Patriots are our friends, they've always helped us, they've always been there, and vice versa. Uh, in 1777, the, U, the U.S. government recognized the Oneidas for their uh, contribution in uh, the battles that they did fight with them. 
this was the very first battle of the siege of uh, uh, Fort Stanwix that resulted in the Battle of, Aris battle of Ariscany, August 6th of 1777. When this battle was concluded, uh, they moved on to um, supporting, fully supporting the, uh, the Patriots and moving on to uh, the next uh, conflict, which was, over, which was over in Saratoga, New York. Uh, the Oneidas arrived there for the second battle of Saratoga, uh, which uh, with their help, um, aided them in being successful there because when they came to the forefront with their style of warfare, uh, the Oneidas thought it, um, uh, in, in a very layman's term, ridiculous to stand there in a, in a parapet line firing at one another, uh, what they would call a gentleman style. Uh, they thought it was kind of ridiculous to do that. Uh, when the equivalent of 10 Oneida soldiers uh, was equal to about 100 of men in a column. Because as they would fight, what they would do is actually flank the soldiers on each side and begin to run back and forth the length of the column and do their war cries. And as they would do their war cries from the wood lines, they would have a couple of their men firing upon the, the soldiers, the hundred soldiers. And the thing was, is they couldn't find out where they were because they were always moving and doing their war cries. Uh, so it was equivalent to, in a column of a hundred men was equivalent to 10, of the Oneida soldiers. So during the Battle of Saratoga, they used that same tactic and they were successful there pushing them back. Uh, once they committed to Saratoga, they actually, uh, they actually moved on to the uh, recognition of uh, General Lafayette. Now, General, at this time, Lafayette was in his early 20s. Uh, he was a young uh, general for the, the Patriot Army. And he took notice to their style of fighting and thought that he could shape that and reform it and use their style along with um, their tactics of war. Uh, and what he asked for was to get some 100 soldiers to go to Valley Forge and train. So in December of uh, 1777, the winter of 77, they were asked to go to, uh, they were asked to go to uh, Valley Forge. So they began their trek. And you gotta remember now, the dedication of these Oneida soldiers, uh, these Oneida warriors, they went to Valley Forge. It's an estimated uh, anywhere from, from this geographical area uh, down through Pennsylvania, down through the Susquehanna uh, into Valley Forge. You're looking at about 280 to 300 miles. Now, what they did was they brought uh, rations of corn with them. They brought six, 60 bushels of corn. Uh, one bushel is about equivalent to 50 pounds or so. So they brought um, 50 of these, uh, 60 bushels of these of corn. Now, now, the unique thing about our corn is that it can be stored for many years and then prepared and cooked uh, and it would be just as fresh as it was if you were to cook it just the day you picked it. So that's one of the unique things about the corn that we use. Uh, when they got there into, for, into Valley Forge, uh, 47 uh, of the warriors 
had arrived in May of 1778. And everybody knows the, uh, uh, the winter of 77, 78, when uh, General Washington's soldiers were starving in Valley Forge. What's just now coming to light and the historians are finally giving credibility to it is that the Oneidas did in fact bring 60 bushels down and prepared it and help feed the soldiers uh, at Valley Forge. Uh, that's one of the things you readily see uh, in the history books about uh, the Oneidas being involved in the revolution, that they helped them during the uh, time of need. Uh, alongside of them, they brought one of the ladies from the uh, Oneida village, uh, and her name was um, Polly Cooper. Now, Polly Cooper came down and she kind of helped the warriors as they traveled. Uh, and when they arrived, she showed them how to cook and prepare the corn. And she was one of the uh, main uh, people who, who gave uh, all the information and knowledge to prepare this corn for them. So she ended up staying there after the soldiers were done training. And now that you see on your screen, there's a shawl there and a, and a bonnet. Now, the reason for that is George Washington's wife, Martha Washington, uh, brought on Polly Cooper as her aide. Now, in doing so, um, they became very good friends. Now, in one day when they were out to the market, uh, doing their shopping, Mar uh, Martha noticed that Polly was looking at one of the shawls and bonnets and she knew she couldn't afford it, but she just wanted to look at it. She thought it was a very nice piece. And Martha ended up buying it for her. And Polly was, was so pleased with it that she kept it in ward all the time. Now, this piece, even when she came back to um, her roots, back into the Oneida village in upstate New York, uh, she brought it with her. And to this day, this shawl is still uh, recognized as a remembrance of that time period and Polly Cooper and everything the Oneidas had done for uh, the soldiers in Valley Forge. Uh, so we still have access to the shawl and the bonnet. I believe it's with her uh, her family that is, stems out of uh, the Onondaga Nation today. Okay, so now that the soldiers are in Valley Forge uh, and under Lafayette's direction, Lafayette decided to try and go into Philadelphia, but he was warned by Washington not to go. But Lafayette, against his um, recommendations, went anyway. And ahead of them were a, a scout of, uh, I believe it was 20, 25, sold, uh, 25 scouts went ahead of the, the uh, column, uh, ahead of uh, Lafayette's column. And in doing so, uh, they noticed that General Howe of the British were coming up the same, uh, the same uh, road. So the Oneidas, they say that 10 of them stayed back and began to um, start a little skirmish with the, uh, the General Howe's soldiers to stop them. So they stopped them to kind of just uh, buy them some time as the rest of the warriors ran up to uh, Lafayette. Now, Lafayette was at the intersection where it's known as Baron Hill. Now, when he got, when the warriors got there, they told him that uh, 
there was a column of two, they said at least 5,000 men coming to your, towards your 2,000. And so Lafayette took his men, turned around and went back across the Skykill River. And uh, now this is another part, an important part in history that uh, as the end of the column was going back, General Howe's men began to catch up to them and there was a skirmish at the Battle of, they call it today the Battle of Barren Hill. Now, what they didn't tell you that, they said, it, it, the history books say that the Oneidas turned and ran. Uh, but today they realized what the Oneidas did was they ended up separating out, sending two groups uh, in east and westerly direction, splitting up General Howe's men so they would, so they could buy time for Lafayette to get across the river, in which they did. And the rest of the Oneidas stayed back and fought at Barren Hill. Now, if you go to Barren Hill today, there's a marker there in the churchyard uh, where the uh, Lafayette was encamped there. Uh, the marker there is, is a little six foot tall uh, granite stone marker and it names all of the six Oneida warriors that fell there uh, during the Battle of uh, Barren Hill. There was a couple of uh, Lafayette's men that were wounded, which were carried out and uh, the only uh, casualties were the Oneidas, and the Oneidas stayed back to fight uh, General Howe's men uh, before they snuck out and uh, made it back across. So the six men were uh, warriors were recognized. Uh, I believe it was in 2013. There was a, another repatriation to the Oneidas because of that finding um, by the historians. Uh, I'm gonna start to wrap this up pretty quick here because I think we're running into a little bit over. Miranda? Uh, that's all right, we can wrap it up and then we can have time for questions, but go ahead. Okay, so uh, throughout all those, all those skirmishes of the Battle of uh, uh, Oriskany, the Second Battle of Saratoga, the Battle of Barren Hill, everything that the, the Oneidas have aided the Patriots in the, uh, the United States with. The Oneidas have fought in every battle and skirmish since the beginning of the development of the United States of America. So that's one of the things that the Oneidas recognize their, themselves with is the first allies and their contribution to the country, even to this day. Uh, we just had a ceremony not long ago, uh, recognizing our uh, indigenous uh, warriors that served in uh, the uh, uh, services, uh, the military. So every battle, the Oneidas have uh, made their contribution to uh, the United States of America. So um, we are recognized as the first allies. So with that, uh, and, and like I was saying, Miranda, we could go on. Yeah, of course you could. For, for more, you know, for another hour about some of the logistics of that whole thing, but um, I'll turn it over to any questions. Uh, people may have. Uh, what, that last one you just, can you flick that back on the Treaty of Canandaigua? Yes, I can. One of the last points of the revolution, and if you see here, it's the Treaty of Canandaigua. Now, uh, after the war was over in 1783, uh, they came up with the Treaty of Fort Stanwix. 
And the Treaty of Fort Stanwix was, one, it was an agreement between the uh, Patriots and the Six Nations and the Oneidas. And the second article of the Treaty of Fort Stanwix, the Oneidas are recognized alongside of the um, Tuscarora. The Tuscarora is an adopted nation that came into this geographical area in the early 1700s uh, and fought alongside the Oneidas and the, the uh, Patriots. So they're recognized also in the uh, Treaty of uh, uh, Four Stanwicks. But there was still uh, some basic uh, squabbling going on within the Six Nations because uh, if you look into some of the history books, uh, those nations that sided with the British, uh, and when, it, when you look at why did they side with them, and it, it's a simplistic reason, it's because uh, for the Senecas and the Mohawks, it was all about uh, getting and retaining their land. The British promised them the frontier if they won the battle, everything west of the frontier line would maintain and be Indian land. Uh, and everything east of there would be considered colonist territory. So when you go to look at those nations in the telling of it, they sided with the British. And when the British were conquered at the end of the battle, uh, at the end of the Revolutionary War, um, they were also recognized as conquered nations because they were now conquered because they sided with the British. Uh, so there was still squabble within those uh, geographical areas because uh, the Oneidas were uh, given their ceded lands back. They were saying, you can maintain and keep your ceded lands because you helped us during the, uh, during the Revolutionary War. But the rest of you, uh, there was still some uh, not clarity. There was no clarity to the end with the Treaty of Fort Stanwix. So in 19, or 1794, uh, Timothy Pickerton was charged with the writing of the what we know today is the Treaty of Canandaigua, uh, what was which was signed on uh, November 11th, uh, 1794. So this right here are the is the articles of of that treaty, uh, but in that treaty it depicts the land of all those nations and recognizing the sovereignty of each one of those nations. So it recognized that each one of those nations has a geographical standing within uh, its ancestral homelands and has a, uh, uh, a status of, of sovereign standing. So uh, that's a very important piece to remember uh, because even today, it's still recognized. It's one of the oldest treaties that is still recognized by the federal government. Uh -huh. Okay. So uh, I just want to make sure we got that involved in there. Yeah. Um, okay, I stopped sharing. Okay. So I'm going to open it up to questions. And I've actually have a, a few questions that came through Facebook. So I'll start with those. Okay. Uh, one question was, when the Oneida were with the Continental Army in uh, 1777, were they employed mostly as skirmishers and not line infantry? Or how did they? Go ahead. When they got, it wasn't until they got into um, Saratoga that they started to get recognized as a part of their infantry. Uh, at that time, that's when, you know, the, the gorgets, the, uh, the fancy brass or silver uh, neck pieces that some of the recognized um, generals or people like that would wear. Any of the leaders of those warriors, the head men were giving those gorgets and 
there was a sign of ranking. So let's say they were uh, they were promoted to the highest rank within their warrior status. They were given the uh, gorget, and the soldiers would have the let's say the generals or any of their military would be addressing that person wearing that gorget versus just any of the warriors. Um, so they were began to be recognized. And when Lafayette requested their presence in Valley Forge, that's when they got more of a standing of a soldier status because they learned their, uh, their Steuben rules uh, of fighting, you know, the parapet line and then how to, all the procedures of firing their muskets and all the, um, all the follow through to go through the steps to do it. So it was after, after that point, they began to be recognized more as soldiers. Okay, thank you. There's another question. Um, who represented George Washington when the Treaty of Fort Stanwix was developed and signed? Uh, I believe it was signed by um, Marinus Willett. Uh, uh, he had the authorization of, uh, I'm not quite sure. I'd have to look back at my records. To, but I know Marinus Willett was one of the signers and a few of the chiefs from the Oneidas are signed on there. Uh, a lot of the, even on, you can see on that Treaty of you know, Canandaigua, some of the old stick figures were signed on it. Uh, so the chiefs would have signed it, but they would have used their, um, I guess more of an understanding would be like a, their hieroglyphic um, symbol. Uh, and again, it goes back down to their, con on the condolence cane, that's what their chief status was, their little symbol. But yes, to, I, I don't believe George Washington was there for the signing of Treaty of, because that was done at Fort Stanwix. Okay, we're getting a lot of positive feedback on, on Facebook and here on Zoom, just to let you know. Um, one more question that came up is Polly Cooper. Do you know if she was related or married to the Cooper family in Cooperstown? Um, or is that? The lineage of Polly Cooper, I'm not, I'm not quite sure of. Okay. It's very possible. Um, where, where, if people are interested, can they find more information of um, Han Yeri and Two Kettles? Uh, if they go to the Oneida Nation uh, .com website, uh, we have some information on there, and it can give you a, a good leading trail of where to get a little more deeper into that stuff. Because there's a lot of documented information about Han Yeri out there. Okay. I think uh, that's all the questions we have. I'm going to open it up. Does anyone have a last minute question or a remark for Ron? Um, otherwise, we're, we're going to wrap it up. Um, and Ron, if anyone has um, any more questions, um, are they able to reach out to you or should they go to the Oneida Indian Nation website, how can they get more, more information if they are if they, go to the, if they go to the Oneida Nation website, uh, they, there's an area there um, that allows them to ask questions. And once they do, those will get routed over to me. Okay. So if you have any um, more curiosity or questions and you go to the Oneida Nation website, uh, you can go through there and uh, get connected to the people with more information. If they want to get, also, uh, we do have the Sagoe Cultural Center uh, where we do have uh, our artifacts and some information about uh, Scandendoa and uh, some of the chiefs from, chiefs that we uh, have known of the past. Okay. Okay, good. Well, thank you so much, Ron. And thank you everyone who's um, watched and commented and asked questions. Really, really great to do this tonight, and I'm, I'm very happy 
So I hope you all have a really great night and we will see you next time. Bye everyone. Bye Ron. Thank you.